A bit of Wollongong, 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 Wollongong. That's speaking of which, the uh, the guy who wrote that song died a couple of weeks ago. Really? Yeah. Lucky Star? No, it? no, he didn't write the song. He wrote. He did the definitive no, he, version. He didn't write it. No. Yeah. The American guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah American. No, guy. no, he's an Aussie. Oh, I thought that Lucky Star had nicked it and it applied Australian names. No, no, oh. it was an originally an Australian guy. He did a version, and um, but he wasn't considered star material until Lucky Star came along, and uh, Lucky Star did it and uh, made it the big hit. And it's been everyone's done it. Been Mate, so sometimes I can go on without knowing what I'm talking about, but if I may be allowed to tell you a little more, I've been everywhere was originally by an Australian, Jeff Mack. He wrote it in 1959 in a couple of hours, sitting in his panel van outside of a gig, poring over maps of Queensland, Victoria, and New South Wales, the only maps he had which is why the lyrics include no towns from South Australia, Western Australia or Tasmania, and only one from the Northern Territory, because he needed Darwin to rhyme with Jin Jin. I've Been Everywhere is the most recorded Australian song other than Waltzing Matilda. It's been sung by Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, Hank Snow, Lynn Anderson, Asleep at the Wheel, Statler Brothers, Rick Moranis, Dolly Parton, Chris Christopherson, Stompin' Tom, Jailbird Rolf, Homer Simpson and Rihanna, who used it as a euphemism for a tour around her body parts. Two hours work, and he was still living off it 50 years later. Now, to this episode. We're talking with Neil Rankin, drummist and all-round good guy. But we neglected to mention during this recording about his latest project, The Druid Dudes. If you get a chance, check them out. That's it, The Druid Dudes. They have some lovely atmospheric pop that's worth a listen. So, now to the show, and our first ever guest, Neil Rankin. Thank you for listening to this important edition of... Is this shirt slimming? Is this shirt slimming? Presented by Christopher Sulos, Robert Barnhill, Philip Muscatello. The highs, the lows, the triumphs, the invigilators, the laughter, the tears. Is this shirt slimming? I guess it must be a podcast. Oops. Last night we were doing a technical rehearsal, Rob. A what, Phil? A, a technical oh. rehearsal. It's kind of he's like never, it's never it's heard, kind of like the uh, the concept album. It's kind of like the concept album of uh, the technical Shoo. department. Shoo. Nevertheless, there's more grilling we can do. So, first of all, I'd like to say hello and introduce our first guest ever on Is This Shirt Slimming? His name is Neil Rankin. He's a trivia host, a DJ. He's a drummer. He's a bon vivant, an all-round good guy, and uh, we're very pleased to have him here because we're going to talk about uh, some things in, that we're, we're quite interested in musically. But first of all, Neil, tell us about yourself. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm honoured. You know, first guest, do I get a prize or, you know, it's like your mum said, you know, first time you do anything, do you get a wish? But I'm not allowed to tell you guys, so I get a wish, all right? Um, but t- talking about me, um, yeah, been a DJ... Currently playing Ringo in the Beatles, have been doing that since 2002. Is that because of your striking resemblance to Ringo Starr? <laughs> well, look, you know, as this is a, just a, an audio podcast, you know, like I, I'll have to let the, uh, the listeners make that up for themselves. But um, <laughs> I, I'm left-handed like Ringo is left-handed and that's one of the things that we were talking about last night. So it's, oh, it's made it a little bit, Uncanny. A little bit easier to replicate uh, a Ringo-style role because he starts on his left hand going around the kit and so do I. So drumming, uh, I, I guess I'm the king of uh, tribute bands because like uh, I've done a lot of, <laughs> a, a lot of tributing in my time. Um, I was in the Australian Doors show from 1989 to 1996 and we did five UK tours wow. and played Israel, and, but I wouldn't play Israel now. Um, but that was in the Rabin days. Uh, it was a bit of a different vibe. And, yeah, lots of Europe, Amsterdam, Belgium, Germany. The other tribute bands I've done have been a, a Dylan show, um, Rolling Stones, an ABBA show... And the best one and most enjoyable was the XTC, Nigel, the Australian XTC experience. So, um, yeah, absolute freak for XTC. Got all their albums and 
doing songs too that you wouldn't even expect. So I don't know, Chris, are you a bit of an XTC fan? Oh, I, all, I've or? never been a full. I, I like their singles, but I've, I've never really investigated them. I really should get into them. Yeah, well, one of the you know, like when you look at the history of music. It's rare, aside from perhaps some of the jazz artists, that you can just think of bands, uh, unlike, you know, like the big discussion we had like with the Beatles, you know, as an obvious example of a band that just improved with each album. I think XTC were a little bit like that as well, and that they just got, oh, wow, better and better, you know, with each album that they, they, they did. So it's not too many artists that you can say usually it's like a great debut and then it's all downhill from there, you know. Or some What's your favourite album, Neil? For XTC? Oh, jeez. Yeah. I, I'm just... I'm, I know mine. I, I'm, I'm loving None Such at the moment. I'm just playing that. Oh, I love None Such, know. but English Settlement's my favourite. Oh, that is so good, isn't it? You know? And when, it's a great record. And when they do, so, they do Yacht Dance, you know, like at the yeah. live and just like to hear that... You know, like, and just like... Oh, cool. oh, so good. You know, they really do it so respectfully. So, did you get dressed up, Robert? I did. What was your favourite uh, little outfit? Oh, lots of outfits. Uh, always a dress shirt and black trousers, generally. Yes. Lots of shorts. Well, you are out um, after Ties. All. Yes. That's right. Yes. Um, polished black shoes, cufflinks, shirt buttons, button studs, shirt button studs. Um, always had to be a frilled shirt. <laughs> yeah, I do like. Um, I do like a bit of frilly action. Bit of show business. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've, I've I've got a nice watermelon frilly and uh, a nice lavender frilly and uh, a sort of oh lime. You know, you, you call it. Mmm. Mm. <laughs> Just getting back to XTC for a moment. Uh, my favourite album is Skylarking. Skylarking oh, is such a beautiful, a beautiful album. Such an evocation of the English summer aesthetic. And who produced oh, that? I've got aesthetic stuff. in there. We try and get aesthetic, aesthetic into in. every year. Um, got it in. Every year. Uh, and it's almost a concept oh, album. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's well, an unhappy Tom album Rundgren. to make. Ah, uh, they always moan about it, but it's like the fighting between Andy Partridge and they moaned and moaned about but, Todd Rundgren. Know, oh, everyone but, does. But bugger it, you know the results <laughs> speak for themselves. You know that is just oh, there's years as promised. So, Sophie, uh, report. Have you done your music report, Sophie, for us? S O P. The Sophie Report. Have you done the Sophie Report for us yet? You were going to do a, a report for our next program, our next podcast? Oh, no. Well, Phil, that comes under the topic of the heading of homework. No, no, I asked... Which means she doesn't no, have to do it. No, I asked... Do you ever do homework? No, I asked... Hang on, my head thing's in. I asked Dad what did he want me to... What did, it, what did I have to do? And he said, oh, don't worry about this week. Wow. <laughs> Tough taskmaster. <laughs> Poor discipline. <laughs> wow. Well, next week. That's, that's, um, that's Neil there. <laughs> Come on. It's, Hi, Neil. Hello, Sophie. You know, so obviously it's in the, in the music report that you're going to do, are you going to be doing, like, you know, Sophie's Choice? Sorry. I, ha- I oh. had to. I had to. Oh. I had to do oh. it. So. Oh. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what I have to be doing. I hope you feel like you're sitting in a nappy. <laughs> <laughs> That's not my choice. <laughs> a full nappy. <laughs> no, it just happens. Keeps, keeps you warm on the cold nights. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. Well, for a while. <laughs> if you wear a wetsuit, well, you, if you, wear a wet suit, you warm tofu. more of your body. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good idea, Phil. No, no, always yeah, thinking. You should go to bed. <laughs> Say goodnight. <laughs> who, who are you listening to? Are you, uh... Uh, I like the song Slow Hands by Niall Horan. Or he was in One Direction. Oh. oh, have they broken away? Is it a breakaway act? <laughs> no, they all split up and they all <laughs> went in their separate ways and now they do solos and stuff. Oh, it's four times better. It's a really good song. Yeah. 
Anything else? Thank you, darling. It's really good. All right, Bye. so can I have my headphone back now? S-O-P-H-I-E-S-R-E-P-O-R-T. Okay, so getting back to Neil, I mean, there's so many things. I, hey, there's hold so many. Before we get back to Neil, <laughs> something, some. Something incredible happened I know, today. I know it's been an incredible day, but remember, we're not um, making this time specific. But we are living the moment. But we have to mention Glenn Campbell. Glenn Campbell's passing. Oh. Yeah. First album Sorted. I ever bought was a Glenn Campbell album. I've always loved him. He was fantastic. And Wichita Linesman is my favourite song. Wow. And we were going we to do a top ten tonight, but we've sort of forgotten about that. We have. But um, I was going to nominate... Glenn Campbell and Jimmy Webb as a Is double Jimmy act. Jimmy still alive? Yeah, he, he was out here recently. Um, I saw him the last time he came out here a few years back and, yeah, he was excellent. He, he recently... Yeah, he's great. On the last Letterman show, they did a full recreation of MacArthur Park. It's on YouTube. Fantastic. So, cool. And, and Jimmy, oh, excuse me. Jimmy's in the midst of it, so... <laughs> <laughs> We've got a website as well now. Do you know what our website is? Mm-hmm. Tell me, Phil. Ah, what's the website? It's slimmingly. Slimmingly. Dot dot com. Dot com. Oh, let me write that down. And in terms of professional podcasting, I would appreciate everyone sharing this podcast as well when it goes to air on um, Facebook so we can get this out to the world because we're up to nearly 200 downloads, gentlemen. Wow. Crikey. I haven't heard it yet. And we've got, a fan, we've got a fan in San Jose. <laughs> Boom, 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 whoa, 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 boom, 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 boom. I saw Dion Warwick at the uh, at the at the um, Hilton. I saw her at Panthers. Angela, and- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're talking. <laughs> Is Panthers the Vegas of the West? No, that's Ru- that's Rudy Hill. That's Rudy Hill. Rudy Hill. That's it. Yeah. Oh. That's it. Okay, back to the point here. We're, we're talking about Neil and Neil's history. The Australian Door Show are quite re- legendary. Legendary enough, in fact, that Dave Graney wrote a song about you. <laughs> Is that the Doors Plus theme? <laughs> no? <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> Don't you be knocking those doors. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say too about seeing the Door Show because you did a um, reunion a couple of years ago that um, I was privileged enough to attend. And um, I've, I've got to admit that when Lauren and I, because Lauren's not a great, a great one for gigs and especially for rock music, you know, and I said, look, we'll just stay for one set and then we'll, uh, we'll, get, we'll sneak out, you know. And she was quite taken with you guys. We actually stayed for the whole show. It was so good, you know. And neither of us are Doors fans either. It was the perfect way to see the Doors without Jim Morrison. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know what he's going to be like, you know, whether you're going to have to... Pour him on stage or whatever. Well, there's that there's that there's that story there's that story that um, during one European tour, um, Jim Morrison was just laid out on the floor on stage most nights, and Ray Manzarek, being the kind of musician he was, was able to not only play his bass with the foot pedals and play the keyboards, but he was also able to do a passable Jim Morrison impersonation, singing the songs as well. Being in Europe, they didn't even know what it <laughs> what it was that was supposed to look like. Oh, and the days before videos and MTV. Not that MTV plays any videos of music these days, but but certainly I have to say that the guy Steve Griffiths, who um, uh, filled the leather pants for those seven years, uh, did a far 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 better job than Ian Asprey did from the Cult when they did the Doors of the Twenty First Century out here. It was certainly worth the price of admission alone to go and see Robbie Krieger actually play there in front of you because, my goodness, he is awesome. That slide guitar that he plays in uh, Who Do You Love? But Ray was just playing a chintzy synth. I was just like, where's the B3? Where's the Leslie? Where's the... the what are you doing, you know? And, oh, yeah... Briefcase and, you know, just like just had a drummer that couldn't swing, you know, so when it was Roadhouse Blues on, it was just like, you know, where's the... Where's the chug, you know, like, not, nah, you know, so just straight up and down. It's like, it's a dying art. And there you go, getting back to Ringo, you know, 
probably the last great swing drummer, you know, to to play. So um, apart from two Aussies that I've got to mention, and that's Steve Presswich from Chisel, who's a great swinger, and um, and Phil Rudd from ACDC, because that's why that stuff sounds so good, you know. No matter what he might do with putting a contract out on you in more recent times... <laughs> But uh, he can swing like a dunny door. And, you know, like DJing, you're putting on a, you know, like... You know, like it's just like great swing. Rock and roll, you know. Like it's not just rock, 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 rock. You know, can you just um, clarify a little bit about the swing? Because um, I'm a bit confused. Swing to me sounds like it's a... Dun, 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 you know, it's like a, it's a jazz feel. It's not a rock feel. I thought rock, rock was pretty much too for... To the floor. Just, well, you sound like Bill and Ben the flower pot men then, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> My swing story, though, is um, I was in Dulwich Hill one day and I, I could hear, it was a, a, one of the festivals and um, I could hear this full on brass band playing and um, they were doing Boogie Wonderland and I was going, I know that sound of that bass. I know the sound of the bam, bass. Bam, bam, and, it was, bam, bam. and it was Chris. And bam, I knew it was Chris. I, I could oh. pick the sound. But they were the only, it was the only band that I've ever heard make Boogie Wonderland swing. <laughs> they could do any song. They could make it swing. <laughs> oh, that's such a good song to put on when you're DJing though, isn't it? If you're doing a wedding, you want to build it up to get to Boogie Wonderland. That's, that's your aim, you know? That's the one where the glitter cannon's going to go off, isn't it? Glitter cannon! <laughs> last night, How Rob, many have you got of those? <laughs> I haven't got one yet, but last night Rob and I, uh, Rob, uh, Neil and Chris and I were talking about because now since I've been playing Xanadu in my set, I've just got this this desire, this urge to get a glitter cannon to go off right at the, the, the climax of Xanadu. It's like my life will not be complete until I have that glitter cannon. He's, he's fighting his fear of disco. Have you ordered it yet? Why don't you get into um, pyrotechnics as well? Yeah, well, it's, it's only it's a stepping, it's a gateway, isn't it? Really, it's a gateway it's a ga- drug. <laughs> <laughs> a glitter cannon's a gateway drug. <laughs> but anyway, sorry, getting back. Oh, sorry, we were getting we we're talking about swing drummers, and we were, who was a great swing oh, yeah. drummer? Oh, Ringo being a great swing drummer, and yeah, I think you know, in 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 studying it and actually seeing it graphed, you know, like when you put it onto any of the modern music programs, you know, when you can actually physically see it, and you just see. One of the things that they talk about is just like being so early and almost like finished by the one, you know, so that the the beginning of your bar, the first beat of it is is done, you know, like the kick is on on one and three usually, you know, in rock and roll. The first kick is just done and dusted by the time one actually arrives, you know, so that gives it the, you know, and then you're just like almost late because with his snare that he does, he just digs it in so that he's hitting the rim and the snare at the same time so you get this flat, you know, it's almost like a sink, a, a flam, which is usually two, two drum sticks at the same time or just slightly tiny bit apart. And that's what you get when you just do a rim shot and snare and skin at the same time. So you've got that, uh, you know, like the, it's, you know, it's like James Brown, you know, it's all about the one, man, you know, so that, uh, you know, like he's bang, you know, with that, that before the one's actually even arrived and then almost late on the two and four and that's how you get that, I, I think, you know, if you're trying to technically explain it, you know, that's how you get um, a swing thing. But it's it's got to be, it's got to lope, you need a bass, you need a bass player that can, you know, lope along with it. You probably, you probably know about this, Neil. There's an internal dialogue also with the dynamics between the hi-hat, the snare and the bass drum and not, they're not always the same level. And that follows a contour as well. So you've got that expansion and contraction from the first boot to the end. So it, it, so it expands and contracts halfway through the bar and also to the, to the end. So it feels like it's slowing down and speeding up at the same time. And, uh, and you've also got this internal dialogue with the hi-hat, the snare and the bass drum. They also talk to each other in a regular rhythm. And they communicate and then they have their own little micro levels between them as well because they don't all sit at the same dynamic level all the time and that gives you different tones it's all co- it's a it's a very complex way of playing and Ringo was very it, well I, I heard this beautiful uh, expression from a young producer who said Ringo is the original hip-hop drummer which which explained it's like when I heard him, yeah you're right and he was hearing it he said that's that's what the sound of hip-hop it's that that stiffness that they that you think it's stiff but they've got this little thing happening they borrowed it from Ringo 
And he'd, all, he'd also put this grace note on, you know, like before the yeah. two and four, you know, as well. Yeah. So that, that leads into it, you know, so you fall yeah. down, you know, yeah. into it as well. But also the way, the, the, the physiology of it, instead of most drummers when they're hitting the hi-hat or up and down, you know, like as my mum said, like, you know, the country la-la, you know, but <laughs> the, the swing of Ringo's is a natural arc, you know, just yeah. like tick tock, you know, the bottom of a pendulum, you know. So mm. it, it has to swing, you know, like there's yeah. just no two ways about it, you know. And plus, you can really just glance across it as loud as you as you as you like, and so you can really get some big volume by you know doing that, right? other than you know up mm. and down sort of thing, which kind of is limiting. It, it, it's Ringo's glancing across is so idiosyncratic of Ringo that, you know, it's like, well, why don't more people do that, you know? Like, because that just gives you a great swing, you know, with your hi-hat technique. Is, 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 is this shirt swimming? When you're doing um, the Beatles or, you know, John, is it John Densmore from The Doors? Yeah. How much do you, do you study? Um, that well, obviously, you've studied um, Ringo because um, I mean, you guys in the Beatles are um, what's the word perfectionists in terms of capturing the the feel and the sound of of the band. How much do you inhabit the drummers, or do they in, do they inhabit you? It's you know method acting. You know you've got to you know where's my motivation here? You know like you've got to get inside the drummer. You know so. You know, it's it's typical when I do a gig once a month with the guy who writes my trivia that he will just throw things at us just out of the blue. So he'll do an angel song. So I'll switch to playing open hand like Buzz Bidstrup does, you know, like so instead of playing crossover, I'll switch to like, you know, like playing, you know, you know, take me away to Marseille, you know, you know, like and then it just gives you that, it gives you that sound. You know, I do a Keith Moon takeoff where I grab the stick by the end and play like they're, you know, like I'm holding the stick like it's a claw, you know, sort of thing, and play like that. And it helps you play like Keith Moon because then you get the sound. So it's the same with Ringo, that if you tuck your elbows in, almost imagine that you're, you're tied to a tree, you know, like around with a rope around you so that you can't move your elbows away from your torso and swing across like that and trying to dig in your stick, your left hand stick, you know, into the snare and also try and kick through the kick drum rather than bounce back, which is what you usually would do if you're, you're playing, you know, like so that you're, you're not sitting on it, you're coming away from it so that you can give the, the kick drum a bit of a note sort of thing, but Ringo's into it and stays there. And if I've ever done any teaching of drums, which is been rare, but one of the things I really sort of start off with and said, look, man, you're not playing a lead instrument here, you know, you're there to provide the groove. That's the most important thing that you can do, you know, because it's your band, you know, you're, they're your horsemen of the apocalypse, you know, those guitarists out front, you know, you're driving them, you know, so you've got to drive them nice and consistently, you know, nobody drives like, you know, or, you know, so it's just... Hang like, on, I, wonder drivers, if Barry, I wonder if Barry Manilow's drummer ever felt like he had the horseman of the apocalypse in front of him. <laughs> well. He had one of the greatest showmen of all time. As voted so. by Rolling Stone magazine. <laughs> yeah, I know. never knew up until last year that it was Brandy, the this, this song. I never knew, I'd never heard that song. And just I, it was one of those things. Brandy's the original. Then he changed it to Mandy. Yeah, the original, yeah. They had to change. Um, no, that was her name. That was the girl's name. And so, yeah, to avoid that, you know, he changed it to... To a girl's name. <laughs> well, or, well, either that to a, or to a downer's name, you know, like there's a, a nice pill called a Mandy. Man, so. Mandrax. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he couldn't, couldn't get anything to wrong with Mandrax. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anthrax? Uh, hang on, I just want to go back because um, it's a great image that you're just driving. You know, you're the, the chariot driver and you've got the horses out yeah, in yeah. front of you. That's a great image. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're your beasts, you know, like that you will use those to attack with, you know, and just drive them, you know. And so, like, to have really good players that you're playing with and that you can really, you know, lock on with them or a singer that can really belt it out. And I've just been so lucky that I've played with such really good singers, you know, uh, that you can really drive them, you know, hard, you know, with just some really good, like, kick up the bum, you know, kick drum. 
um, and, and you know when it when it really want you really want it to cook, you know you can really lift them, you know as well. Like you know you're applying the lash almost, you know, to them. So well, wow. uh, Dr- drumming is a is a um, a, d- a form of domination. That's amazing. I never really thought of drummers being dominators. No, like we're that. the ones, you know. It makes a lot of sense, Phil. You think about it. What was it, what was your first band? Band called Adrenaline. Mm-hmm. And, uh, oh, and let's rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's sliding. So, <laughs> uh, and then um, there wasn't any money in Originals music, you know, as all of you guys know. So we turned into a covers band, and that became Carbon Copy. So, um, and and uh, that was a that was a great little. Was there a hidden meaning in that? Uh, well, you know, the kids t- today wouldn't understand what a Carbon Copy is, you know. But uh, back then, Gestetna. Um, yeah. Oh, the smell! <laughs> oh, I love the smell. <sighs> excuse me, just excuse. I've got to go to the bathroom, guys. I'll just be back in a moment. Keep talking, keep chatting. Again, you went last as week. As soon as you say Gestetna, <laughs> did I? Yes, yeah, he said Gestetna. He's got to go. Oh, he's got to have a sniff. Yes. <laughs> I've got to go to the bathroom to do a line of coke. Okay, <laughs> this is rock and roll. Oh, oh, he's, oh. he's had a lot of pasta. Well, look at this juncture in time. I think I might just go to the fridge and get another beer. So uh, you can get it talking. I'll have one. Matter of well, fact, you? I've got it now. Maybe, maybe I'll get myself a little wine cooler. Oh, get the bladder out, mate. Get the goon. <laughs> <Dooney. laughs> <laughs> just I'll be back. I'll be back. Back to probing Neil in depth. We just want to get the finger right in and uh, find out a bit more about this. <laughs> Assume the position, Neil. <laughs> Well, so what? Yeah, sorry. We were carbon. We were okay. We were back at Carbon Copy. What sort of songs we was Carbon Copy um, paying tribute to? Ah, uh, look, you know, it was uh, got a little bit cabaret, as as uh, Rob was talking about. The singer used to put on the um, the bald swimming cap, and you know, would do we do the you know the hands out Peter Garrett. Uh, you know, it was all contemporary stuff at that time, and now that all that stuff is still being played, but it's just it's a retro band now. So, um, yeah, you know, U2 and, you know, Metal is Anything and just everything that was being played in the 80s. Just it was such, such good music to play. So as a, as a drummer, how did you find the 80s snare sound? Uh, well, you know, I, I've still got the, um, the Pearl Free Floaters, you know, like the, the brass shell and they just crack, you know, so... I loved it, you know, like it's like drummers, you know, front and centre, you know, so it was like, right, well, okay, here I am. I'll just, we were doing uh, some Simple Mind stuff, you know, like that was just great that, you know, on the waterfront, you know, I remember going to see them, you know, and he had mounted kick drums, you know, it was just like Tom sort of thing, you know, to get the, you know, boom, 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 you know, like, you know, like just, yeah, man. <laughs> Except you get somebody else to set them up. I, I got to set them up, and I have to pull them down again. So I think I'll just stick to a little kit, you know, because that's just <laughs> less packing up and more talking to the girls. So, thank you very much. <laughs> Lucky girl. <laughs> Ah, the Golden Sheep Hotel on a double bay on a Saturday night. My goodness gracious me. The amount of formals that we did that year. Woo! It was, it was a very good year. <laughs> so um, so uh, then after that, um, I joined a, a blues band called Blue in the Face. Um, and... <laughs> <laughs> Enjoyed that for a, a year or two. Yeah, Chris was in a, Chris was in a Greek uh, version of that band, uh, Blue in the Face. <laughs> Might. <laughs> Might. <laughs> yeah, that was late 80s and then, yeah, joined the Australian Door Show and then the Beatles from 2002. The Door Show, like you were saying, it was an international act. I mean, you got to tour 
extensively around the world? Is it because there was no one else that was doing it or you were just doing it better than anyone else? Um, I, I think there was some others that had just gone, yeah, that's a really good idea. We, we might do that as well. But I just don't think that they'd done it as extensively or with the same sort of spirit that we did it in because we really just went, right, well, if we're going to do this, we're going to try and do it, you know, Right, so we learnt a lot of their repertoire. There weren't too many Doors songs that we didn't know. Um, and so we would always change the set list around, you know. So, um, you know, quite often starting, you know, ironically, you know, with the music's over or the end, you know, even we'd start with. So if it was that kind of mood. But usually, you know, kick off with Break On Through and, you know, just work our way chronologically through the albums. But... Um, uh, I, I like Steve Griffiths was fantastic, you know, and Stan, who who plays, who played Ray Manzarek, is a very, you know, big guy, and he's got massive hands, so he could get that real hand span thing, you know, with the dun, 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 boom, 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 you know, for the the left hand, and Larry the Mogadon Tiger, you know, on on guitar was just like amazing, you know, as well, you know, with the SG and just really going for it like like Robbie does. So we wouldn't try and do it note for note so much. We try and do it more when you see the Doors playing, they're a bit more sort of jazzy. So um, that's the way that we we would try and approach the songs. Um, So in the Light My Fire solos, for example, we'd never do the same solo twice it'd it'd revolve around that theme of what they're playing and you'd come back to certain moments but the singer was was it you know like he he put his heart and soul into it so much so that he he buggered his voice up really you know because you've got to sing open throat and he had to have an operation like he got through the second uk tour where he could barely speak the whole tour Um, but he would somehow find something to be able to sing each night and yeah, he was a great showman as well. So um, it was it was a great light show. Lots of oil wheels, and you know, de- definitely designed for people that were taking psychedelics that became popular again in the early nineties. So, oh, by the way, you know the Doors. If you're a Moog aficionado, the Doors were the first band oh, to record the mini the Moog, Moog again. Oh. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Let me just get one. <laughs> Is that true, though, Chris? That like, because in that article, I don't know that I was talking about that. You know, the 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 prog rock article. You know that that Moog is supposed to be pronounced more like. Moog? Uh, it, it both both of them are acceptable. Uh, Robert Moog Robert Moog uh, says that parts of his family pronounce it Moog, but it's a Northern European name anyway. Um, so yeah, and his family pronounce it alternatively, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, fair enough then. Thank so you tell us your Moog, tell answer. us your Moog story, Chris. That was it. The Doors were the first band, I think. But the first the rock monkeys, band, the, the monkeys, band. the monkeys used um, the Moog in a song. Mini Moog, the Mini Moog Model D, the famous one mm-hmm. that Rick Wakeman plays. The the Doors were the first to record that. Okay, I right. th- yeah. yeah, we'll have a look. There's that. Oh. Um, yeah, you can. You can well, you, well, okay, let's have let's, Phil's gonna let's, check let's on have you. an edit point then, Phil. <laughs> See, this is what I've got to put up with, Neil. Every week, it's a, it's like a competition. <laughs> <laughs> Who can Google faster? But I work on this kind of examination. Um, just while they're doing that, I just want. How do you actually feel about the Doors music? Because I got to say, I'm, I'm a bit conflicted by the Doors music. I always feel. I mean, you know, when you're young, you love the Doors, and I think there's always. A, it's like there's this continuing cycle of 18-year-olds who discover the Doors music and it really speaks to them. And then when you're, by the time you're about 25, it's like, oh, I can't really hack them. But how do you feel about the music now? Well, for me, it was just, you know, too much familiarity, you know, of just playing it, playing it, playing it. We did over 2,000 gigs, you know. Mm. So for years, I'd never put on any Doors music. You know, what's the point? You know, like I know it backwards. But introducing it to a, a friend yeah once again like a, a young friend and just like here you know listen to these guys this was the sort of music that i played for a few years and and particularly putting on that first album you know like that is just what a debut 1967 so 50 years ago all of these amazing albums just all came out in one fell swoop you know, so aside from obviously, you know, Peppers, you know, in the next room, you know, like there's Pink Floyd doing, you know, Piper at the Gates of Dawn, you know, 
Hendrix's first album, The Doors' first two albums, you know, came out in 67. And then other great stuff that's not quite as well known now, but like Ogden's Nut Gone Flake, which is a great, you know, Small Faces album. Or The the Kinks with Village Green Preservation Society, you know, which I love, you know. Have you read um, Dave Davies' autobiography? No, but I've read I've read X-Ray. I've read the, the Ray one, which is, is quite tastefully, artistically done because he set it in the future, you know, and this, you know, like j- journalist is, you know, like trying to get things ready for the archives, you know, and goes back, you know, to, to talk to this guy, Ray, you know, so it's good because he doesn't have to just do it all in chronological order. So, no, I'd love to read Dave oh, Davis. Dave Davis account. is very disparaging of The Doors. He, he thought that The Doors were like a cabaret act. Well, at least The Doors were one of the few American bands that were actually playing their own music, like we were discussing, you know, uh, last night about how it was just the Wrecking Crew and, you know, the Motown band. What's what the Motown band called? The, the, Funk, the Funk Brothers. It's just those two bands that play everything that you hear from... And Glenn Campbell, who passed away today, was part of the Wrecking Crew before he became, you know, the, uh, a solo star. So great guitarist, played on the Beach Boys stuff. But, yeah, the Wrecking Crew, you know, like Hal Blaine and, you know, God, Carol, Carol Kay on bass. Wow, you know. Well, have a listen to, have a, yeah, Carol Kay, have a listen to Hal Blaine's interview on a podcast called I'd Hit That. And he's got, I think he's um, episode 100 or something, but uh, Hal Blaine, it's like a two and a half hour interview because Hal's in his 90s and the guy's gone up to his, um, to Hal's place in Miami because Hal's retired and um, it's, and Hal talks about how much he made, where he made it, the royalties, how much he lost in his divorce, how much other people were making, people he toured with, and Carol Kay. But Carol Kay is a great bass player. She's a phenomenal bass player. But uh, there's there's some recordings which she claims to be on which she's not, and that's part part of the the myth busting that Hal's uh, decided. Well, to it's too shy because because Carol. Carol also speaks often disparagingly about Hal Blaine now. You know, like, we, we weren't called the Wrecking Crew. He's just made that up, you know, like, so there's, there's a Yeah, there's I know, a lot I've of, heard. But Carol's lost a lot of money. And th- so I, I don't blame her. She, that's why she promotes herself because she's, she's spent a lot and she's been ripped off a lot by, by, by bad boyfriends. And that, you know, there's a chick on her own in the 60s bringing up kids. And, yeah, she didn't have an easy life. I'm just looking at a list of Hal Blaine tracks that he played on. Wow. Yeah, yeah, just Frank Sinatra, Nancy Sinatra, Beach Boys, oh, forget all monkeys. Those deals. <laughs> forget all those. He played on I Think I Love You. <laughs> oh. Ding, ding. And forget ding, that. Ding, ding, he topped ding, that. Ding, 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 he topped ding, that with ding, ding. Love Will Keep Us Together. Oh, Captain and Tennille, yeah. as written by a, a good Neil, Neil Sadako. Oh, hold on. He's, he's topped it again with The Way We Were. Oh. Yeah. Oh. He played on These Boots Are Made For Walking. That's Mr. right. Mr. Tambourine Man. Thank you. Help Me Rhonda. Thank you. Eve of Destruction. Thank you. Monday, Monday. Thank you. Strangers in the Night by Frank Sinatra. Wow. <laughs> which is apparently... This is Robinson. Which, which he, he, he... Where did I read? He said that Sinatra didn't like Strangers in the Night because he said it was, it was gay. It was a, a, <laughs> a, a gay anthem. <laughs> And it's like, that makes sense. That makes sense because that, that's how that's how they used to um, portray the gays in. That's how we met. <laughs> but they used to portray the gays in a, in a Hollywood movie. If you wanted to signify there was a gay relationship, you'd have a guy who'd go out at night, inexplicably. He'd go out and socialise at night. That was the the Hollywood symbol of a gay a gay tryst somewhere. I'm just about to pop out. <laughs> <laughs> I may be. I some, might be sometime. I may be sometime. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and have a little pee. <laughs> Is this shirt slimming? We gladly feast on the future to nourish the past. I think we should mention too, uh, Neil, that this uh, sounds like a great podcast. What's it called? I'd hit that, and it's a podcast about drummers, isn't it? Uh... It's a podcast about drummers, but they've ended up interviewing rhythm section players as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, that reminds me. Oh, there's a guy called Steve Ferrone, who's also known as Steve Ferroni, because he's half, he's half Italian, he found out later in his life, who played for George Harrison. There's a wonderful story. And uh, he, he's talking about the difference between playing with Eric Clapton and, uh, and playing with George Harrison. E- Eric had a, a, 
a, not a volatile temper. He had, he had a, a variable temperament, whereas George is really straight ahead and easy to deal with. But when they were doing, yeah, I know, isn't that beautiful? Yeah. <laughs> but George, as as opposed to Paul McCartney, who underpaid. Oh, so Stevie Wonder grossly underpaid, and the Jacksons grossly underpaid. Did he? Oh yeah, big time. Big I've time. never read any of that. <laughs> you won't read it. It's industry knowledge. So George was doing, they were doing the gig and Steve was playing in the band and they were doing, they do something, right? And, uh, and so they'd have a meeting, they'd have the, the get together afterwards and Steve was, Steve was getting, always, everyone gets on with George. And Steve said, um, was the effect, hey, uh, in something tonight, you didn't do the solo. And George said, yes, I did. He said, no, no, you didn't do the solo. And he says, what do you mean the solo? And he started singing the solo from Abbey Road and the band also chimed in with with all of the notes of George's solo and George had to learn the solo from the guys in the band because as far as George was concerned the solo on the record was a solo and he never went back to revisit it because it was a solo so every night he would play an improvisation and the guys are saying, no, you have to play the solo. So he had to relearn his solo. Yeah, yeah, he had to relearn his solo. They sang it to him. He had no idea what they were talking about. Haven't he heard those records? <laughs> no, he's really funny because, he, you know, you watch that anthology and he's just going, oh, I don't know what album was that on. It was a revolver or a rubber soul, I don't know. You know? <laughs> so hilarious. Well, yeah, because so they spent like three it. or four months, three or four months or eight months on a track revisiting it, going back, leaving it, coming back. You know, who's, who else is playing on it? What are we going to do with it? Let's do take 85, you know, vocal reversed, you know, take 87. Not guilty. Not guilty. <laughs> that yeah. never got onto the album. I think there's over, yeah, 90 takes of Not Guilty <laughs> and it never got onto any of the albums. That comes on to one of his solo albums. Oh, when was that? Um, about 74, 75, I think, before it yeah. actually surfaces. So Wow. Um, before he puts it on one of his whole... But, like, and there's... There's versions of it on the anthology, the okay. the three CD versions that came out back in the 90s, but okay. never came out on one. an album. Okay. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Anthology's okay. fantastic. Yeah, I've, I've, I've got a lot of Beatles stuff. I, yeah, I, I've only just discovered that, because I keep thinking they're just repackaging the stuff for the next generation, but I'm just slowly finding out there's unreleased material on some of these things. Yeah, and, and look... They've they've done a marvelous job with the last Sergeant Peppers with the the remix because oh, yeah. I want to get that. Yeah, they've gone back to because even things like you know the the crowd at the beginning you know before the you know like the orchestra's warming up. Yeah, yep. that crowd scene is I think taken from a Pete and Dudley um, record, so he's okay. gone back to the original source material and then mm. put that into the mix so it's just it's been so 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 well documented at the time and then right. revisiting it you know and the tapes kept in such good condition that the, yeah. the remix is is really something you know oh, it right. just <laughs> it lifts it's it's enormous so do yourself a favor go on to one of those online sites, I think, because I think that's hundreds of dollars cheaper than what you'll find it at the local outlets. In terms of inhabiting players, what, what were you inhabiting when you started doing the ABBA show? You know, from our DJing days, Phil, you know, like Dancing Queen is derogue. You have to play Dancing Queen at, at a wedding. You know, there's no two ways about it, you know. And when, when I did, you know, like I loved that bass line and just like, you know, with the graphics to just like, that is one of the best bass lines in pop music history, you know, the bass line for Dancing Queen. I think it's what makes the song. Um, so it, it's, it's very, very good pop playing, you know, so... It's interesting though, Neil, I'm finding that there's a, a market, I'm doing so many gigs now where it's a 50th, 60th and 70th birthday party. I'm not sure if I told you a couple of weeks ago I did um, the best gig of all. It was a two uh, elderly gay guys doing a 70th birthday, a joint 70th birthday, um, both from Darlinghurst. They lived together for a long time. You know, just playing 80s pride classics basically was the, <laughs> the playlist and, um, you know, a few show tunes and that earlier on in the night. And it was kind of like at five to nine, I put on Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. And um, 
finished and I was home by quarter to ten. It was the best gig. <laughs> and a beautiful location in the middle of the city and the, the Hyde Park barracks and the old sandstone cafe and everything. And it was just, just oh, gorgeous. Lovely. But I've said it so many times, but um, it made me lose my love of music. And it's only been by playing guitar again that I've actually been able to rekindle my love of music. DJing, for some reason, just but the, the songs become tools in your toolbox, don't they? Their, their only meaning is their power in making drunk people dance. Either that or, you know, like there's just like there's a, a little bit of education that I, I'd try and do, you know, like playing some Nick Drake, you know, when it's just the quiet moments and then having that guy come up to me and you know just out of the blue at a gig at a corporate gig and he just came up and just said I used to work for BBC Bristol and he came down and I interviewed him I don't know what Nick Drake I was like you're kidding you know like (laughs) he said yeah I don't think it's in existence anymore you know but I was just like oh man Tell me, you know, what was he like? And you just said, yeah, well, he was just lovely, gentle, but funny guy. That's the thing that he really remembered most was just saying, you know, how funny, you know, he was, you know, and self-deprecating. So it's just like, oh, wow, I've met somebody that's met Nick Drake, you know, this is great. Because I don't do any education anymore. I used to feel like I'd want to do education, but now it's much more. No one gets the shits if you play the hits. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, there's some stuff that I, you know, still love playing. Like, I, you know, and I still love Aretha Franklin, you know, Say a Little Prayer, you know, like it. And that I used to play that at every wedding, you know, and and just like that is just such a good song. You know, mm. the the arrangements of that and playing on that is just, oh, God, I play every gig. so good. Every gig nearly I play Ain't No Mountain High Enough. It's just one of those songs. Oh, yeah. 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 Right at the end of the night, it's just one of those great songs that. Um, which you know. which version do you play? Who, oh, whose version? Marvin and Tammy. It's got the mojo, and you know I'm not going to look anywhere else for it. Songs have mojo, and sometimes they, they have the mojo. Sometimes they lose it, and then they get the mojo back again. And uh, it's riding riding that mojo. All killer, no filler. <laughs> <laughs> More bass in all frequencies. <laughs> More bass in all frequencies. <laughs> Professional show business timing, which means the time has come for us to end this evening. Neil, thanks very much for joining us. It's been such a pleasure. Oh, we ought to knock that naughty clock that says it's time to go. So, um, yeah, thank, thank you so much for having me. Thank and you, boys Rob and, and Chris, it's been really listening. beautiful seeing you again. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Neil. And Thanks, Rob. Bill. And Rob, can you share on Facebook yes, Phil. these podcasts? <laughs> I'll, I'll try, and I'm going to have a very good go at listening to one. <laughs> I love you. I love your commitment. Well, next time we're together, can we really focus in on Linda McCartney's backing vocals? So, so do we do the sign off where I, where, where I say something like, "Oh, what's that music? What does that music mean, Phil?" Oh, it means we're coming to the end of uh, the the pleasurable part of the evening, the end of the musical part of the evening. But your evening can continue on after this because we're going to say goodnight from the Slimming team and thanks very much to Neil Rankin for joining us and spreading his special kind of love with the boys. <laughs> Good night. Peace and love. Good night, Neil. Good night, Rob. Good night, boys. Good night, Phil. Good night, boys. Good night, Chris. <laughs> I'd anyway, I just wanted—I okay. just wanted to say that so we, we had that, uh, so we had a, a professional yeah. ending to the show. We can do it again. Did, was that any good? Was that okay? We can do it again. Let's do it again. It sounded beautiful. Yeah, Should we sure? do it so we don't talk over each other? Doesn't matter. We've got discreet tracks. It's yes. easy enough to wear. That's oh, so that's good right. having oh, yeah, the, okay. these discreet tracks yeah. because yeah. I can yeah. um, I can get the timing of the jokes much better than when we actually tell them. <laughs>
<laughs> really did them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's almost like we, we had professional show business time. <laughs> but um, um, that's... Uh, 